and it is indeed a pleasure to welcome you all today um, to hear um, from someone who I think is probably one of America's best experts on the entire Middle East, but particularly on Lebanon. As most of you have read, um, yesterday shots were fired um, in Beirut um, as um, people in Hezbollah and the Hezbollah faction of Le Lebanon have been calling for the removal of a judge um, to um, Tariq Batar. Um, they've called him a US agent in the investigation of the explosion in the port of Beirut on August 4th, 2020. Um, and that's after a year of, um, of the probe. Um, and um, we are, this is extremely germane. Also, just recently, again, after over a year of political infighting, um, Lebanon finally has the government. Um, we are um, extremely honored um, to speak about this incredibly important little tiny nation that's gone through so very much um, that is just um, north of Israel's border. Um, and uh, in order to discuss these and some other um, very, very relevant issues, and Matt is proud to host Tony Badran. Um, Tony is a research fellow at um, an excellent think tank that we call upon a lot, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, where he focuses on Lebanon, Hezbollah, Syria, and the geopolitics of the Levant. Um, Tony was born and raised in Lebanon and has testified before the House of Representatives on several occasions um, regarding American policy towards Iran, Syria, and Lebanon. His research currently focuses on the relationship between Iran's Hezbollah model um, and regional states, as well as the history of and future scenarios um, for Israeli and Hezbollah wars. His writings have appeared in such illustrious publications as the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, um, the New York Times, um, the, I'm sorry, the New York um, Post, the Washington Post, um, the Atlantic, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, the Weekly Standard, um, and he is a columnist focusing on the Levant for Tablet magazine. So Tony, um, first of all, Welcome back. It is always a profound pleasure to have you speak for a minute. Um, your knowledge and understanding of the Middle East and particularly of the Levant is second to none. Um, so we all remember um, the disastrous explosion on August 4th, 2020. Um, it's taken over a year for the probe to possibly reach its conclusions and suddenly Hezbollah has called for the removal of its judge, Tariq Batar, um, and has called him an American agent. Do you believe that anyone connected with Hezbollah will ever be indicted or convicted when it comes to the explosion in the port of Beirut? First, uh, Sarah, thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, I appreciate uh, all the nice things that you said. Um, I don't know. If, if they're necessarily true, but I appreciate it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Our organization is called EMET, which means <laughs> truth and <laughs> so it has to be true. <laughs> um, well, th thank you. Uh, I, to, to your question, um, I, let's start with, with uh, a few things. So um, I think the title for today's um, event is that um, Hezbollah is a, Iranian state within the state. Let me start by disagreeing with this categorization. Um, it's wrong on two counts, on what Hezbollah is and what Lebanon is. Lebanon is not a state. Lebanon is a fake state. Lebanon is a make-believe state. Uh, people refer to it as a state for convenience, um, you know, it has the trappings of a state, uh, but it's not a state. Um, it's an arrangement between 
sectarian warlords and oligarchs. The top dog in this arrangement is Hezbollah. Hezbollah is not, however, a state within the state, even if it is a fake state. Hezbollah is simply the state, whatever that state is. It just simply um, has, it's part of the government, it's part of the parliament, it's part of the municipalities, it's part of the administrative structure, it's part of the security forces, it's part of the military, it's part of everything. So to call it a state within a state as though it were some isolated enclave in an otherwise functioning uh, apparatus is simply not true. They're not isolated. They're not separate. Um, it's not that the small part directs the large part from a distance. No, they're one and the same. They're fused together. So um, it's not... Uh, analytically uh, meaningful or actually useful to talk about Hezbollah as separate from the state or even parallel, even if it is, even if it does have its own parallel structures, which incidentally all the other uh, components of the Lebanese arrangement do. Of course, Hezbollah has it in a much more organized and elaborate way. But the any analytical framework that presents Hezbollah and the state as two uh, parallel structures is wrong. Hezbollah and the, whatever you call the Lebanese state, however you want to characterize it, are one and the same. Uh, with that, uh, we can then go to the second uh, part of the question, which is about this uh, port explosion. Um, it's not only Hezbollah that wanted this investigation uh, stopped. Uh, in fact, there were lawsuits filed by members of the so-called pro-Western March 14, whatever, if people remember that relic from the past, uh, which is a combination of the other sectarian uh, parties and oligarchs in Lebanon that for a while posed as anti-Hezbollah. Um, and they, uh, as participant in this, participants in this arrangement called the Lebanese state, um, they all have a stake in running these uh, uh, state utilities, uh, like, you know, the port and other, uh, you know, services and, and infrastructure. Um, and their ministers were in power at the, during the time in which the ammonium nitrates were stored in the Beirut port. The military knew about it, the government knew about it, the customs knew about it, everybody knew about it. Um, and everybody was involved in it. And therefore, nobody wants this convert, uh, this uh, investigation to go anywhere. So, like I said, members of those parties were filing lawsuits to remove the judge, the investigative judge. So it is not as though there is, you know, something here and then again, Hezbollah alone leading a charge against uh, uh, some sort of a, a rule of law movement or... So uh, that's second. And then the third aspect of your question as to whether Hezbollah will ever be held accountable. Uh, people tend to forget that we had not just a Lebanese investigation, we had an international tribunal, UN tribunal, funded by the US taxpayer, incidentally, uh, for, uh, partially, uh, for, for years and years and years after the assassination of the former prime minister Rafiq Hariri in 2005. Uh, so that's what, 16 years, it just, or rather 15 years, so it just concluded a few months ago. Uh, and it convicted a Hezbollah operative in the murder. Uh, and then what? Who cares? Nothing happened. Uh, who's going to, what's the mechanism 
by which you bring these culprits to justice? What are the agencies that through which you can actually bring, what are the state institutions? This is a category that uh, US officials are very fond of using in their comical rhetoric on Lebanon. We need to strengthen state institutions uh, like the Lebanese army, the security forces, and so on and so forth. So what does that mean? Where are they? Where, uh, where, uh, how do they actually go about and, and, and implement such, a, such an order uh, you know, or to, to bring these people? To it doesn't mean anything because they cannot operate when the government itself says no. And Hezbollah is the government. And therefore the consensus required for the political decisions by the government to the security agencies and the other agencies to uh, implement whatever policy requires agreement between the oligarchs that form this quote unquote government and of which Hezbollah is the lead actor. So it's a contradiction in terms. So the United States can talk as much as it wants Today, for instance, Victoria Newland announced $67 million in additional aid to the Lebanese armed forces. This is on top of $45 million that, million that were announced a few weeks ago by Tony Blinken. This is on top of an additional $215 million, I think, that were announced much earlier in the year. This is on top of $60 million in cash that were announced in the summer that were given to the military. So all of a sudden, we're creeping up on half a billion dollars in US taxpayer money being shoveled out the door to the LAF, because the idea is that we need to build the LAF as a counterbalance. These are meaningless words. These are words that mean nothing. Counterbalance, what does that mean? In actual real human terms, how does that actually become reality? It means nothing. So you have millions and millions and hundreds of millions, and actually when you, when you when you play it out over the years, billions of dollars that the United States has paid to this Iranian controlled fake state, make believe entity that um, uh, in who's, who's uh, and, and they sold it as though the issue is to build up their capabilities and capacity as though that were the issue. Meanwhile, no, security force or agency or anything in Lebanon can actually take any uh, measure without a government, if this, is, if this is a government agency, without a government policy. But Hezbollah is the government. So it's a contradiction in terms. The issue is political. It's the nature of the political order. It has nothing to do with, with capabilities and, and, and whatnot. So all of this basically is to say that when we're talking about Lebanon, we need a lot of precision in language because there's just a lot of you know, meaningless words. And that's what US policy has become, just words, a bunch of words that are just spit, spit out and, and nobody really understands what they're saying. And nobody, you know, so you, you use categories and terms and words, and then you say, well, what does that actually mean? And, and, and so there's a disconnect between um, uh, words and, and analysis and policy recommendation and actual reality as it is on the ground. Thank you. I can't thank you enough for, for that, especially, and I humbly stand corrected, um, but per, in most um, particularly because of the years and years and years that Ahmed has spent trying to educate policymakers against this um, endless um, cycle of throwing good money after bad to the Lebanese armed forces in this um, absurd, absurd, um, you know, looking at Union Security Council 1701 and saying, okay, we have to build up the Lebanese armed forces and get rid of our foreign entities. And so we are just, and it doesn't happen. So um, can you, I just make it very, very clear, um, what, to what degree um, does Hezbollah control the Lebanese armed forces? Because this is very helpful to us. 
Okay, there's a lot of um, misconceptions here about the nature of how Hezbollah uh, controls the, the whole political order, right? And so which this misconception uh, often is very deliberately and dishonestly used by the cheerleaders of the policy of aid and U.S. government officials and Hill staff members, and et cetera, et cetera, to say that, you know, to reduce the, the matter to either um, the issue of uh, um, end use of the, of the equipment that we give to the Lebanese officers, say, well, they have a fantastic record. None of their equipment ever leaks to Hezbollah which is a red herring, uh, and I'll explain in a second. And, so, and the issue, uh, the second issue is um, to say, uh, no, no, um, you know, we, there's good officers, they're excellent officers, you know, and then, and then we can isolate the pro Hezbollah officers and promote the good officers as though this is, this is how you run uh, the military. Neither of these things are meaningful. Um, it's just, like I said, it's, it's, it's a red herring. It's, it's just a way for them to, whenever they're asked and confronted, to bypass the issue. The issue of whether the Lebanese armed forces gives its weapons to Hezbollah um, is irrelevant. Um, the issue is, when you say, well, they have a track record. Well, you have a track record until you don't. Because the point is, you're sending, the point is not to whom you're sending weapons. It's where you're sending weapons. You're sending weapons into what US officials today call a failing state. And now the goal is that we need to prop up this military because if we don't, then everything we've given it can go to God knows who. So, I mean, just think about that. <laughs> think about this, that you've spent years and billions of dollars sending equipment. And just recently, just yesterday, they announced that they were sending like a few helicopters to the military. The they themselves say doesn't have the fuel or the money or the ability to even maintain this equipment because they, they don't even have food. We need to pay their salaries. This is, this is the other thing now. They're, all this money that they're putting out is, um, is meant to, uh, to to have the US taxpayer underwrite the salaries, benefits, and pensions of active duty and retired LAF personnel. That's what the American taxpayer is paying. Okay? Uh, so the, um, if, you're, if this is the, the comical nature of this third world fake state that you're sending all this equipment to such that if this, this army could collapse and God knows where, where your weapons do so that the purpose of the policy now is to make sure that it doesn't collapse so that your weapons are, there's something extremely wrong in, in, in your policy, number one. Number two, it, the issue of officers and visit, there's an officer here. Let's start by re-explaining once more the nature of the Lebanese polity, such as it is. It's a, it's a sectarian arrangement between oligarchs. Everybody gets a share, it's allotted along sectarian quota. And that goes to the very lowest, any appointment in the state, okay? So the nature of the military and the officer corps follows the same pattern. And this is by, uh, it, this is the law basically in Lebanon, I mean, it's law, okay? This is, the, this is how things are. You have to allocate this so if Hezbollah is part of the political game, which it is, it, it, it is, it, it is its right to do so according to the rules of the, of the political order. It is its right to appoint ministers and administrators and officers in the military and so on and so forth. Okay? So... To, and, and, and you know, run in municipal elections and then run municipalities, which then get their budgets from the ministries mm -hmm. of the state. So by funding those ministries, you are funding a system in which Hezbollah is a player according to the rules. 
of that. So leave aside the appointment of individual officers or whether this officer has influence. It doesn't matter. The overall policy of the government has to toe to Hezbollah because Hezbollah is the strongest element in the country on every level, on the first and foremost, the military, military and security level, the demographic level, uh, the financial level, okay, as well as uh, the political. So on every possible level, they are the strongest uh, uh, component in this, in this case, uh, backed by a state, okay? So, uh, if they are part of, or actually the lead actor in the government, nothing that in terms of policy can happen. The LIF cannot do things on a policy level that the government does not approve, okay? And conversely, what they do is approved, which means if they did something, it's something that Hezbollah approved. And if they didn't, it's because it wasn't. And then there's, of course, the stuff, the de facto stuff on the ground, where you have, like in South Lebanon, where they um, routinely uh, sabotage and uh, um, uh, obstruct UNIFIL activities, and, and such as they are, and, and, and patrols and investigations, and so on and so forth. On behalf of Hezbollah, it's both because Hezbollah is the de facto power on the ground, but also because that's the policy at, at, uh, you know, at the government level. Okay? It's not like there's someone that in the government that's going to say, no, 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 you, you should be doing this. It's not going to happen. So you can build their capabilities as much as you want. None of it makes a difference. None of it is ever going to be in any way a problem for Hezbollah, on the contrary. Way back in 2005, um, after the assassination of Rafi Kareri, um, I had thought that one of my most sanguine mo moments in relatively recent Middle East history was the Cedars Revolution. And um, you just referred to the March 14th element as the oligarchs. Um, what's happened? Uh, because like everything else in Lebanon, it's, it's a hall of mirrors. It's an illusion. It's not real. Um, um, there was a moment in which people expressed um, dissatisfaction, anger, uh, sadness, a range of emotions. Right. And, but it was, it was a moment. To, how do you actualize that into something else? Okay, that, that's when the people who are actually mobilizing the majority of the participants in these rallies were the sectarian parties, okay? And what was their first order of business? Was to enter into a unity government with Hezbollah. Okay, so they were, I mean, it, it's not, you know, so, there's a lot of illusion. Now today, the latest um, illusion, or you know, it depends on your point of view, I would call it a hustle. The latest hustle is to sell um, the idea of civil society and civil society NGOs that the United States should be funding, should forget the March 14. That was a bust. They're part of the oligarchy, say these guys. So really what you should be uh, supporting now are civil society NGOs. And you should be funding these guys and you should be doing so. I mean, Victoria Newland made it now part of her stop in Beirut to talk to them. So it's very important because it's very, you know, very real, you see. Uh, and we're going to talk to these people and we're going to fund them because they're going to run in elections in the spring. And that is really important because it means something. None of it means anything, okay? These people, if they win, let's say they win a few seats, whatever that, you know, well, however many that, okay? So what? What does that do? How does that actually do anything? It, 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 
it's meaningless. It's just a hustle. It's just a way to get the U.S. taxpayer to 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 to, uh, to uh, cough up more dollars and spend it on a chimera in the Middle East somewhere. It doesn't mean anything. But that's you know that's what you know that's the livelihood of sort of the Beirut, what I call the Beirut DC corridor, because half of the people you know live here half the year and visit back and forth. It's, you know, spot so, up analysis. Right. That's that is utterly dis disconnected from from any reality of um, what the interest of the United States is. So what is the United States to do? I mean, there is horrific hunger and famine in Lebanon since are, are we just, uh, the NGOs are not, you say, are not reliable. Um, no, no, it's not I, that they're not reliable. It's that, it, it, I mean, what are you doing with them? Are you, are you, are you, is it a vehicle to send humanitarian aid? So, or is it a vehicle for political change? Is That's there any, is there any recommend, I mean, you know, you know, there's power outages, fuel shortages, not only the Hezbollah can eat meat, you know, it's, it's, it's outrageous, but what, what is the solution? Are there any solutions to the, the horrible famine um, within Beirut, particularly since the explosion? I, I, I don't know if I would be that dramatic about it, but I don't know if, uh, even, if, even if it is beyond humanitarian aid, I mean, I don't know why, first of all, we have to ask, why is this a concern for the U.S. policy? Other than a humanitarian angle. Okay. Humanitarian. So, okay, so there's a humanitarian angle. You send humanitarian. Right. But, but that's not really what this conversation is about. So when people are talking about this, they're not talking about it from a humanitarian perspective. They're talking about it from a policy perspective. Now that's separate. Policy goals for U.S. interest in Lebanon. And therefore, and so then you have a buildup of using the humanitarian pretext to start pushing policy issues that are completely separate and are completely bonkers. So the idea becomes that you no, know, the U.S. has to stabilize Lebanon because otherwise Hezbollah will take right. over Lebanon. It, that's a fallacy on its own terms. Hezbollah right. already has number one. Right. Or if Lebanon goes into state collapse, quote unquote, then you know you will have a catastrophe, uh, epic proportions that will affect the entire universe and so on. Really? I mean, how so? Uh, please elaborate. You know, and then sometimes they will give you examples like, oh, you know, there, there will be an export of terrorism and um, narcotics and so on. It's like, hold on, you know, Lebanon was the epicenter of exporting narcotics and terrorism throughout the world at the peak of U.S. support for Lebanon and other, fin uh, other people's financial support for Lebanon, Saudi, European, whatever. Right. Uh, so, and before the financial crisis and economic crisis. Okay, right. which is their own doing. We have nothing to do with that. So if Lebanon at the peak of its stability and support, external support, was the epicenter that was driving hundreds of thousands of Syrians out of their houses and sending them as refugees throughout the world, the epicenter of the amphetamine captagon trade throughout the region, the epicenter of money laundering in which every single Lebanese bank is complicit, uh, the epicenter of arms and militias and you know, aimed at Israel and the Iranian sort of destabilizing effort in the region. So what are we talking about in that regard when you say, oh, no, no, we have to prevent state collapse lest this happen? I think that's a hustle again, it's a scam. It's not, uh, it's not honest analysis and certainly not honest or meaningful policy prescription. Um, so the, the idea, we have to go back and ask more fundamental questions. Um, is Lebanon meaningful to US policy? If so, how and why? And, and, and therefore, once we've established these two things, then you decide, okay, then what steps do I take and what steps are necessary to take? Uh, I wrote uh, an essay in late 2020, I believe, uh, for the Hoover uh, publication, uh, The Caravan, in which I asked the question, does the United States need a quote unquote Lebanon policy? Because the idea of Lebanon policy 
takes you into the labyrinth of parochial nonsense of the Lebanese, you know, where you have, I have to support this guy, I have to fund that guy, I have to, uh, okay, uh, no, none of this is relevant. Mm -hmm. There's a difference, and now the, the, there's a conceit also that was added, layered on top of that, which is that in so doing, we are, quote unquote, competing with Iran. You know, we are competing with Hezbollah by, uh, you know, if Hezbollah wants to bring Iranian diesel, uh, by golly, we are going to wheel Egyptian gas and lift sanctions on Assad to compete <laughs> with, uh, to, to get that gas to Lebanon. And this way we compete with Hezbollah. Um, uh, if Hezbollah, uh, you know, has a, a military, then we are going to compete with it by paying the Lebanese army hundreds of millions of dollars. It's, it's, it's insane. It's, I mean, it's laughable, but it's insane. But that's what Lebanon policy does. That's where it leads you. So um, the issue is to distinguish between, um, first of all, to establish why Lebanon. Lebanon is, and if it, Lebanon is meaningful to the United States, it's meaningful because it is the epicenter of a terrorist organization that runs it, runs all of it, um, and uses it and not just its territory, but its institutions, its banks, everything to, uh, as a destabilizer. Now, the United States doesn't act kinetically necessarily against that. Uh, Israel, which is the party that's directly affected by it, that is a US ally, uh, usually is the party that takes kinetic action. And you know that's their decision as to when and how they do that. Uh, the United States should not in any way uh, impede it or or manipulate it or condition it or so on. But the United States can take other actions that are mainly sanctions related or intelligence related. But once you've established that that's the only point of interest for the United States, then Lebanon policy as described earlier is irrelevant. You're not there to compete. You're not there to play political engineering in Lebanon. You're there to target. Targeting Hezbollah and Iranian interest in Lebanon is different from the hustle that the Lebanese lobbyists and operatives uh, and quote unquote analysts push, which is to have more US investment and involvement in the parochial petty, uh, nauseating, corrupt political engineering of, you know, uh, and civil society and all of that nonsense, election promote this officer, promote this party, uh, blah, blah, blah. This is all, a, this is, this, the Lebanese are very acutely attuned to this type of hustle because that's what they've done for decades, if not actually, you know, longer than that, actually, much, much longer than that. Not as, a, as the modern Lebanese entity, but as the territory of Lebanon and whatever politics have existed on there. They're very finely attuned to embroiling outsiders in their own parochial affairs. Uh, so that they want everyone to run their affairs in the name of sovereignty and democracy, which is, which is hilarious. Thank you. I, just another example of that. About a year ago, I wrote an article for Newsweek saying Emmanuel Macron showed us the way when he said that Lebanese leaders are serving their own interests ahead of the country. And I now suddenly he has seemed to cave and wants to just work with Hezbollah. No, 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 not suddenly. No, not that, so. was, that, that was what he did explicitly among the, at the time when you wrote that article. He came to Beirut and met with Hezbollah. He came to Beirut and met with the Hezbollah guys and uh, it was leaked at the time and he never denied it that what he told them was that I want to work with you to build a new Lebanon. He offered a partnership with Hezbollah mm -hmm. because he understands, unlike you know, the posture of US policy that denies Hezbollah control, even at, at least outwardly, you know, implicitly, I think they, they, they understand it and they're operating accordingly. Right. Uh, they just can't say it because by law, you can't support Hezbollah. Right. I mean, it, legally, if you if you admit that Hezbollah runs the Lebanese government, then any offer, any money that you're giving the Lebanese government is circumvents U.S. law. 
Mm -hmm. so, so they create the fiction of a distinction between Hezbollah and the Lebanese state to, to run this scam. But the funny part is at the same time, they're uh, telling the Europeans that they shouldn't separate between Hezbollah's political wing and military, right? So, but the United States has adopted a parallel fictional dichotomy. But I digress. The point is that Macron understands that, Lebanon, that Hezbollah runs Lebanon, okay? And therefore, if he wants to do business in Lebanon and Macron wants to do business, he, uh, uh, he has a lot of business plans because when he came to Lebanon, he brought with him the uh, shipping giant, uh, uh, which is a French company, uh, a container shipping giant, um, uh, CMA, CGM, I think it's called. And it's, um, uh, they, he wanted to rebuild the port so that the French company can operate. He wants to run, uh, he wants to uh, take over the electric sector so that a French company can run it. He wants, you know, they, he has, uh, Total, the energy giant has investments in offshore in, uh, off of the, uh, in, Be in Lebanese waters. Uh, French have a lot of investments in Lebanon. And he knows that to have investments in Lebanon, to say nothing of, by the way, the hundreds of Unifil soldiers that he has uh, in, in South Lebanon, you have to be uh, not just on good terms, but you have to get the okay from Hezbollah to be able to do this business. Okay, so when he came, he was very open about the partnership. There was no, there was no hiding it. I mean, the only people who were talking nonsense about civil society and all that was is, is the United States. He was very clear from the beginning that it's the oligarchs led by Hezbollah who should form the government, who should implement quote unquote reforms so that we can do business. Pure and simple. All right, well, on that cherry note, we are going to now um, turn the floor over to my wonderful colleague, Hussein Obabakar Mansour, who will um, list, um, read the questions that have come in from the audience. Thank you, Hussein. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and thank you uh, very much, uh, Tony, for uh, such a, um, an analytical perspective uh, that is seldom offered when people talk about Lebanon. We've received a lot of questions from the audience, and we encourage our audience, uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, you can post them either in the chat or in the Q&A section. Um, there is one question that a lot of people ask, so I'm going to start with it because that's, you know, it's kind of the toughest question, which is, okay, what are the, what should we do? What are the policy suggestions? Our limit on policy is ineffective and kind of a waste of money. So what is, what do you suggest uh, that should be the U.S. policy towards Lebanon? I don't, I, as I explained in the lecture, I don't think the United States should have a Lebanon policy. I don't think that, you know, we have to step back and decide before we ask, because this is a very American thing. And it's very laudable because it comes from a very optimistic and uh, generous place uh, whereby uh, Americans, you know, see people uh, suffering or in need and they want to help them and they want to, okay. Uh, this is very laudable. And again, I'm separating, you know, giving humanitarian assistance with, from the issue of policy. What do you, you know, what is U.S. policy toward them? Now, I'm saying that in terms of the domestic uh, political uh, game in Lebanon, the United States should have nothing to do with it. The United States should not be funding any of it. The United States should stay away from it from it because it's a dead end. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't advance any US goals. It's, it's, it's just a waste of time and money. Um, now, I said, uh, first, you have to first determine what is, why is Lebanon of any interest? Lebanon is of interest, like I said, uh, only insofar as it is the headquarters of Hezbollah, which is a, the long arm and foreign legion of the, uh, or, you know, unit that does, for, you know, uh, overseas operations for the IRGC and the Iranians, okay? So in as much as that then intersects with geopolitics and U.S. alliances, um, specifically pertaining to uh, Israel, but also in as much as Lebanon is in headquarters for operations Throughout the region, like you know, you see Hezbollah guys in Yemen, you see Hezbollah guys in Iraq, Syria, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then it becomes sort of a, a 
a narcotics terrorism and geopolitical question um, uh, and money laundering question, illegal finance question, all of which involve Lebanon. So my point is that Lebanon policy becomes uh, uh, in direct opposition to and tension with a policy of targeting Hezbollah. For a year, let me give you an example with the Lebanese banking system. For years, okay, prior to the um, uh, Trump administration, but which included, by the way, many people in the Trump administration, the, the policy consensus was that you should not be leaning on the Lebanese banks because if they fall apart, the whole thing falls apart. And therefore, you, you, you kind of push, pull back and do targeted and sanctions and you deal with the central bank government to see if you can to limit major money laundering uh, operations. But basically we knew because the last one that we, we, we sanctioned in 2019 was the Jamal Trust Bank, Hezbollah was using. It was a small bank, but the year before in 2018, and this is an example of Lebanon policy versus Hezbollah targeting policy. In 2018, US aid was partnering with this bank, okay? I mean, it's on Facebook picture, you know, there's a picture of US officials, US aid, proudly partnering with Jamal Trust Bank. A year later, we sanction it as a major money laundering vehicle. For all right. So there's tension between these two. And, and you have to step back and determine what it is that, that your interest is and how you go about it. Obviously, the United States has no business in going bombing, you know, Hezbollah targets in Lebanon, whatever. That's for if the Israelis want to do it, that's, that's them. They don't want to do it. That's also there. It's their decision. It doesn't matter. We take actions that are uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, narcotics, um, illicit finance, diplomatic, et cetera, et cetera, to target irrespective of how that intersects with Lebanese institutions and blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, but without any regard for uh, any political engineering in Lebanon through supporting uh, fictions like state institutions, the Lebanese army, civil society, elections. I mean, none of that means anything. And the United States should have no business uh, being part of it. Uh, so that's, that's, where I, that's where I have a different take on this question of, well, well what do you suggest? What's the solution? I, I, I think it's, the question it, it rests on a false premise that I reject. Um, can we say then that basically our Lebanon policy should just be a function of our Iran containment policy? Well, I mean, it, it is. It is. Now, I mean, now, of course, the Lebanese, uh, uh, you know, because they're, you know, the Lebanese operatives who deal in, po in the policy world, because they're hustlers, they're, they're going to use us like, why are you going after me, man? Why don't you just go and handle the Iran problem? And then that will solve the issue. Just don't touch. It. It's like no, 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 no. You, you. It doesn't matter if it's a part of an Iran thing. Lebanon is a headquarters for it that is destabilizing the region. So if there's going to be targeting that affects it, we're not going to simply not do it just because you're going to be affected by it. It is if you have a problem with it, then it's on you to take on the fact that you're run by a terrorist organization. It's not on the United States to do that. It's not on the United States to solve the fact that you're run by a terrorist organization. If you have a problem with it, then you deal with it or just deal with the consequences of it. Because part of the Iran containment policy is to target, and, I, and target doesn't necessarily mean bombing, right? Or, you know, is to target uh, the tentacles of Iran in addition to whatever policy we're doing with Iran proper, you target its tentacles in the region as well. And if that means that you're going to be affected negatively by it, that's on you, not on the United States. For years, you covered as Lebanese operatives, you covered for the fact that Hezbollah was using your banking systems for money laundering by denying it. Is you who uh, lobbied for the idea of hundreds of millions of dollars to the LAF because that will counter Hezbollah, where, whereas all it has done is facilitated 
Hezbollah's operations regionally, be it in Syria or in South Lebanon. So the fact is that you also were complicit in selling this thing. And not, uh, and not only did you not do anything about it, you're actually complicit in acting as a cover for it. So the United States should pay no heed to this type of, of policy recommendation and should proceed if it wants to target, just, you know, um, uh, irrespective of, of these considerations. Um, another question is, do we know that if the maximum pressure campaign on Iran in any way affected the financial or otherwise support that's given from Iran to Hezbollah? Yes, I mean, there's a misconception here because, you know, the idea is that if the pressure campaign doesn't lead to the total destruction of Hezbollah, then somehow it's a failure. I mean, that's just dishonest. That's not how it works. Um, if you bankrupt a, an adversary, right, and you pressure them hard, if that means that you limit their ability to fund their activities by, let's, let's be modest, by 25%, that's a 25% net win because the opposite is actually not zero. See, that's the dishonesty of the, of the pro JCPOA crowd. Uh, uh, it's not that the United States then becomes neutral in that, in that play. The United States under the Obama administration and now again under the Biden administration, which is basically the same team, is, has, has been to finance the Iranians, to release funds, to relieve sanction pressure, to give them additional resources with which they can then pursue their activities. So we're not talking um, you know, a, new, a, z a zero baseline. You're talking actively funding and allowing access to money versus pressure However much uh, that, you know, uh, in terms of, de however, the, the percentage of the decrease that uh, in effect that it has, it doesn't matter. That's a, to that's a win. That's, that's totally a win. If it's 25%, if it's 40%, that's still 25%, not just below the zero baseline. It's 25% below the zero baseline, whereas the other part wants to fund it. <laughs> to take it way over the zero baseline. So I, you know, so that's, you know, again, it's, it's, there's a lot of dishonesty in these concepts when they're being dis discussed in, 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 in Washington between the proponents of the JCPOA and the proponents of the maximum pressure. Of course, the maximum pressure campaign is the way to go. You have an adversary, you choke their finances. It's elementary. Does it solve the whole problem? No, but if you, <laughs> it's elementary thing, you, you deny your, your adversary and your enemy, you deny them resources, however much you can. And if that, you know, however much that reduces their ability to, to, um, to run their activities, good. Does it end their ability to run activities? No, but it reduces them. And that's, and that's the whole point. You're, you're, it's still a win. Um, thank you. Bizarrely, there seems to be a few folks in, in D.C. who think that allowing your adversary access to resources actually helps you uh, somehow. Um, we, yeah. <laughs> um, there are reports, we received a question about report, reports in the news recently that Hamas is operating in southern Lebanon, and that's apparently causing some problems uh, for Hezbollah. Um, do you have any information about this, or can you uh, yeah, help us? I, I mean, context? Okay. so look, there's, there are some people in Israeli military intelligence who are putting this out, um, uh, that, that Hamas has a, a military infrastructure in Lebanon is not new. That Hamas's military infrastructure in Lebanon is somehow in opposition to Hezbollah and without Hezbollah's uh, 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 permission is nonsense. Okay. There's not going to be a Hamas operation in South Lebanon that Hezbollah does not want. Let's just be clear, full stop. There will not be a Hamas operation in South Lebanon if Hezbollah does not want it. Okay? 
Hezbollah is not going to let anyone else dictate the tempo of its confrontation with Israel in a manner that it doesn't want, especially when Hamas relies 100% on Iranian largesse to be able to function. It's a contradiction in terms, it's silly. There, there's, the, you know, whatever the, the, the point of this uh, uh, talking point that's being put out uh, by whoever it is in, in, in military intelligence, that's putting it out. It's, 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 not, it's not a smart and it's not true. And, um, you, you know, the, not, not, that, not, not that Hamas doesn't have a military. No, that they do. That, that the idea that they're doing it in opposition to Hezbollah, that's, that's just not true. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, whatever the point behind it, maybe the point behind it is to allow for Israel to be able to target Hamas individually, separate from Hezbollah, in a manner that then doesn't break the current rules of engagement that they have in Hezbollah, whereby Israeli activities in, in Lebanon necessitate a response by Hezbollah, which then could potentially uh, uh, become a larger conf conflagration. Uh, if the point is the ability to be able to target Hamas infrastructure or, or to justify Israeli responses to the kind of rockets that we saw launched from Lebanon in the spring, by so-called Palestinian you know, militiamen whose identity we don't know, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, you know, it, it, then it's just simply tweaking the, 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 uh, the existing rules of engagement between Hezbollah and Lebanon. It's not necessarily uh, uh, a, an, an assessment of, an accurate assessment of Hamas's uh, um, activities as being in opposition to Hezbollah. Hamas knows it cannot, cannot operate in Lebanon unless Hezbollah says so. In fact, Hamas cannot operate, period, unless the Iranians equip them. Thank you. Um, we've received multiple questions about the same issue, so I'm, I'm gonna try to combine them all in, in one question. For a lot of people, it seems that the truly resilient and enduring structure of the Lebanese society is corruption. Uh, we received a lot of questions about, you know, corruption of expats and, and capital outflow and uh, things like this. And you spoke about how the Lebanese, you know, Lebanon might have the entrappings of, of state and institutions, but really uh, it's hollow on the inside. What is the future of the Lebanese uh, state? Is there uh, any future out of this or are we stuck with Lebanon the way it is? Yeah, Lebanon the way it is, is Lebanon how it's always been. It's not, you know, uh, uh, in the yeah. 1970s, it wasn't Hezbollah, it was the PLO. Then, then you know, then Hezbollah replaced it, having been trained by the PLO, incidentally. Yeah. Is there any reason that it is the way it is? Because that's the nature. It's not. It's not a state. It's a fake state. It's not. It's a territory. It's not a. It's not a state. So it's an arrangement between sectarian uh, uh, leaders, communal leaders, um, who command the loyalty of their communities or parts of the communities, and are able to mobilize them. And at at one point, they were all armed. And, and they fought each other. Now, that does, there, there is a change. The, the change is that demographically, we're no longer where we are in 1975. Uh, there's massive exodus of people migrated legally. We're not, not, I'm not talking like refugees or um, just legal migration. People left, um, and especially in the Christian population, which is really minuscule now in Lebanon. It's not a factor. Um, and, uh, and then you have a tremendous outgrowth in power, wealth, um, uh, by, on the Shia side. You still have numbers on the Sunni side, but uh, they, are, uh, they are not uh, centralized, mobilized, and uh, so they're, they, they don't count as a, as a factor in that regard. Um, and Hezbollah has inroads in that community anyway, long-standing, you know, going back to the, the 1980s. Um, so, um, you know, 
it's not, and besides, you know, the, the war on terror has been a great boon for Hezbollah. So the, the, the Obama administration during the Syrian war, for instance, labeled or justified its support for the Lebanese armed forces in terms of the war against ISIS. And there was no ISIS in Lebanon, it's, it's, it's absurd, yeah. right? Um, and so we were, we were helping the LAF become a partner in the war against ISIS. What, what that meant is we are indirectly helping Hezbollah by helping its auxiliary force as Hezbollah runs its, its um, war in Syria and, if, and to make sure that Hezbollah, uh, that the LAF uh, holds the security perimeter so that Hezbollah can do its operations, right? That's, that's, that's the idea. So under the, uh, you know, especially with the refugees that are coming to, to, to Lebanon, so on, and then the LAF can harass them, crack down on them, crack down on any young Sunni male in Lebanon at any given point, and nobody can say anything because they'll be accused of being a supporter of terrorism, and the United States will, will you know, applaud. So that so the the so that's why when people say oh no Hezbollah is really against U.S. aid to the military <laughs> this is nonsense they're totally for it they're they're perfectly happy but with it I mean because the LAF this goes back to the point I made very early in the in the lecture is that the um, the LAF can act only against the targets that are uh, approved by the uh, arrangement of the leaders, which we call the government, of which Hezbollah is the leader. The only people in that arrangement that are not stakeholders in the arrangement are Sunnis, so, uh, Sunni Islamists, right? Everyone can say, oh, no, 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 these are not our guys. So yeah, let the army go and beat the hell out of them. You know, that, that's fine. And the, oh, if the United States will pay us money to do so, even better. <laughs> and, 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 and pay us money, again, what is the United States paying for now? Salaries and benefits of active duty and retired personnel and their families. This is not me saying it. This is U.S. officials saying it on the record. That means we are running a social jobs program under the cover of the LAF that sustains the corruption of the sectarian oligarchs who have appointees and all these young men that they're putting in jobs program in the military. Now, in addition to underwriting their equipment, to underwriting their fuel, to underwriting their medicine not, and, and arms, now we're underwriting their salaries and their benefits. I, I you know, point to another military in the world that is entirely from head to toe subsidized by a foreign state. I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, so we're not going to be able to uh, take any more questions. Thank you very much for all our audiences who sent us the uh, many questions that we received. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, well, and thank you. For, you um, look, the name of our organization is Emit. Um, however inconvenient, um, we speak the truth. Emit means truth in Hebrew. And um, I, we really believe that um, it's very, very important that our policy be predicated on truth rather than illusions. So um, what you imparted today was really invaluable for us. Um, we, You are free and the audience, if you would like to pass this tape along to your member of Congress. Um, Tony has um, testified before the U.S. Um, Congress. Um, I would love to take you with me when we argue against um, U.S. Uh, um, aid to the Lebanese Armed Forces, Tony. It, it's, it's incredibly important that we, we, we stop this, this lunacy um, where we are only empowering Hezbollah. Um, I thank you so much to all of our listeners. I should say that all of this um, we do to educate um, the public out there, the public at large, um, as well as members of Congress. And we do depend um, on your support, um, which we, we can use um, very, um, very, very, uh, very uh, sorely at this point in time. So, you know, please, um, I would like you to go to our website at ametonline.org and support us um, so that we can continue to provide these 
excellent and amazing programs to all of you out there. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you. Uh, be well. Bye.